the time is now. Let everyone in the listening audience grab their scriptures, a pencil, and a piece of paper. Listen and learn the true meaning of the Old and New Testaments of the Bible, the Psalms of David, the Lost Books, and the Holy Quran. There are no more secrets. All false things will perish. So come and learn the undisputable teachings of the only man that has the answers to the problems of a troubled world, as Sayyid al-Imam Isa al-Hadi al-Mahdi. And now, the true light, featuring Es Sayyid Al Imam Isa Al Hadi Al Mahdi. What's the difference between adultery and fornication? First and foremost is that adultery and fornication, which has been deluding many people, is not even in the scripture. They have made that up in the Christian church. Now let me tell you why I say that. Because what happens is they have a word zina that they use. The word zina gets its root word in the word good. Go ahead. Zina. Ze ye nun. In Arabic. Zina. And it means to be good, actually. Now what they have done is, and let's establish one thing, and this is a painful reality for the Western world. Okay? That is because, first of all, none of the laws that are in the Torah or the Quran pertaining to premarital sex would apply to them because almost 90% of them have sex before they get married anyway. In the scriptures when they're talking about people covering women, they're talking about virgins. They're not talking about women who have already had sex with other men. The scripture is talking about women who are virgins. The Quran is talking about women who are virgins, not women who had multiple boyfriends. So what happened in the Western world, the women have to realize it's not their fault, but it's one of those things that has happened because you have been in bondage and slavery, and the white man, like I explained earlier, taught you this. But it's a sad situation, but none of those laws pertaining to adultery or fornication would apply to them. Now, the English adultery, to adulterate something, to alter something, right, is to mess up a marriage situation, to alternate, to change a, a marriage situation where some man is married and some woman is married, and to go and have sex with either or both of them is to mess up the situation. However, that again would only apply if the woman is a virgin when entering into marriage. In this part of the world, unfortunately, that doesn't happen yet. There are some women that are virgins, of course, but it doesn't happen here yet. Now, it's up to you and I to raise women who are Muslim women who are what they call virgins, as the book of Revelation speaks, and are protected from the temptations of Satan, so that they may be that pure nation and that those laws in the scriptures will apply to them. We have drunk of the wrath of the fornication of the harlot. We have lived deliciously in her temptations and thus we have fallen victim to the devil. And we have to face that, that those laws just don't apply to the average person. If you are a virgin yourself and then someone tries to cover you before you're married without the intentions of marrying you, then that is adultery. That is fornicating. That is violating the law. You understand what I'm saying? So if a man has intercourse with a woman before they're married, 
then if he doesn't marry her, then he sets out to be a whore. You mean a virgin or a non-virgin? Well, it makes a, a virgin, difference in the picture. A virgin, if a woman's a virgin, right, she has a boyfriend, and you know, like they go together and they have intercourse, then they break up, then he sets out to be a whore, right? Then in the scriptures, what happens if you read the books of Leviticus, you'll find laws pertaining to that. Put it out, she has a baby, and she, she's it's not see, married. You gotta understand that the things that happen in America just don't happen like that in the East, in countries like that. When a woman is betrothed to a man and she's a virgin, this is well thought out. It's not like America where I like your looks, I like your muscles, I like your hairstyle, I like your body, I like your money, I like... It doesn't happen like that. Families get together and they discuss this, they plan this, and a divorce is not as easy as I want out because he hit me or I want out because I don't like this. Or, I want out. It doesn't happen as easy. That's what I'm trying to say. It's very difficult for us today to make scriptural decisions and we have been living outside of the scripture. We've been living like demons and living, you know, living like heathens and Gentiles, but we're trying to make the scriptures comply to our wants and needs. It doesn't work like that. Now, to the answer to your question, if a man and a woman marry, and a woman was a virgin, and somewhere along the line they break up, what happens in the East is that woman has to go home to her family and live there, and she doesn't even consider remarriage if she has a kid. They don't even think like that. That means that was the man for her, and if he lives in his household or her household amongst the women, and she raised the kids. In America, it's like, he didn't work, let me go get another one. Like my car broke down, let me go get another one. People in the East don't treat it like that. That is the Christian ethics that did that. And the reason why that happened, you know why it happened? Because the country is ran by Christians, and the man who they consider the founder of Christianity, which they say is Jesus, never got married, never had sexual relationships, never got involved in anything that had to do with marital law, and nowhere in his mission was he ever questioned about the laws of Moses pertaining to marriage and divorce. Paul came along after him who had situations and made up his own laws in his 13 books in the New Testament, but nowhere is Jesus was being confronted with that. Only he visited a wedding who turned water into wine. That's about it. But no one asked him about married life at all. You see, so he never answered it. So the society that you're living in does not even comply to the ancient laws of the Torah that pertain to marriage and divorce. So it's a very strange thing. That's why it's necessary for us to set up our own tabernacle, our own community, and then raise our children righteous men and righteous women, and then those laws will apply. You understand what I'm saying? Mm. Go ahead. You go ahead. Um, so, so why do you use the uh, Holy Bible and Quran then if those laws doesn't pertain to you. The reason why we use the laws of the Holy Quran and the scriptures is because they do pertain to us. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is a hadith about Jesus. The book me and you should believe in when pertaining to Jesus is the book of Revelation. The other books, like I'll give you an example. Let's turn to Mark chapter 1. If you read this there, it says, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, right? Now, why is it this book 1 then? It should be because it says this is the beginning book. Of the doctor Jesus Christ, the Son of God, that what? As it was written in the prophets, which of Jesus' disciples was a prophet? None of them. Right? So what is Mark talking about here? When he says, the book of the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, as it was written in the prophets, behold, I send my messenger before the face of earth. Are they talking about John the Baptist? Are they talking about Jesus? What book of prophets is he talking about? He's talking about the book of Isaiah 40. Verse 3, it speaks about the coming forth of John the Baptist, the herald of Jesus. You follow that? See, I can just give you a list of mistakes in the Bible. There'll be thousands of them, not one or two. I mean, literally thousands of them. That don't mean you can't read it. You have to know when Allah is speaking in the Holy Quran about the Torah, he's not talking about all of the books in the Old Testament. He's only talking about the five books of Moses. He is vouching for the five books of Moses only. Now, the Sunni Muslims get up and say, but the Bible is tampered with. They're not talking about the five books of Moses. They're talking about other books in the Bible. You understand? When he speaks about the Injil, he's talking about the book of Revelation only. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will vouch for the book of Revelation only. As you see, I spend most of my time there. How? If you, didn't, if you don't use the whole Bible, so how can you just use one statement? I don't use one statement. I use the whole scripture. What I'm trying to say to you is that it tells us that we would produce the 144,000. They'd come out of us. So it's just our children. 
those are the 144,000 the same way Mary gave birth to Jesus. You follow that? And Mary does not get the importance or respect. Nowhere it says, and Mary will be in heaven this day, and Mary sat on the right hand side of God, and Mary, nowhere in the Bible does it give you a whole story about the blessings of Mary, only when they speak about the angel coming to Mary and speaking to her, do they give you any type of indication that Mary was somebody special. Other than that, they don't tell you nothing. It just tells you in the Quran that Mary, you have been chosen. That's Holy Quran chapter 3, uh, 42, that Mary, you have been chosen. You are a pure woman in this world, and you're going to give birth to a special child. But after that, all the attention went to the child, Jesus, not to Mary, correct? Well, the same thing is happening today. You are the one living under Herod. You're living in the New Babylon under Herod. And you got to protect your child, like the Revelation is saying, when it's conceived, because Herod is going to want to kill your child, because you're going to give birth to special children if your intention is to raise them as righteous people. And they're going to want to kill him the same way they want to kill the Messiah or her, because they're going to be the root of the next nation. Go ahead. Uh, yeah. I want to know who gave the laws of um, these contracts for being married. The laws of contracts for marriage? Yeah. We call it nikah. Right? That's the name of it, the Nikah. They were enjoined by the Prophet Muhammad. He picked them up from the children of Israel. The same laws that Ben Israel used in their marriage ceremonies are the same laws we use in El Islam for our marriage ceremony. They came back from the children of Israel, which got them from the Lord of hosts. So the marriage contract concepts come out of heaven. Mm. Uh, that's it. alaikum. I'd like to make this very short. First of all, I traveled 150 miles just to be here today for the first time in my life. And, yes. And um, I have no doubt in my mind, in my heart, who you are. Because in my heart and mind, I know who you are. And you are who you say you are. Uh, this is the question. Of the 144,000, will they all be men or will they be mixed women and men? That's my question. It'll be women and men, like I explained. When it speaks of the 144,000 in the books of uh, Revelation, chapter 14, and it says, And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Zion. Zion just means New Jerusalem. All right? Mm -hmm. And with him was 144,000 having his father's name written on their forehead. Now this congregation, they're going to tell you, is a congregation. And I had the voice of heaven, and the voice of many waters, and the voice of the great thunders. And I heard the voice of the harpers as they were harping with their harps. And they sung as it were a new song before the throne and before the four beasts, which is the four empires of Babylon, it fell, and the elders, and the 24 elders, that is, and no man could learn that song but the 144,000 which were redeemed from the dead. You see, now what? These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. See, a man is never a virgin, first of all. A man doesn't have a hymen. You know what a hymen is? Yes. So a man can never be a virgin. The actual sex act is not what breaks your virginity. Laying together doesn't break the virginity. Entering the woman and breaking the hymen breaks the virginity. You follow? Yes. So there's no such thing as a man that is a virgin. 144,000 are going to be children that blessed women give birth to. You understand that? Yes, I do. Uh, one more question. Of the 144,000, would they be the ones that's going to do battle with the beast along with Madal? Yes. I'm glad you asked that, because the 144,000 who are going to be born by these special women, correct, are going to be the ones that do the same battle that you find mentioned in Revelation chapter 12. The same one, Revelation chapter 12, verse 7, that same incident will happen again. And I saw, this is 20, and I saw an angel come down from heaven, having a key of the bottomless pit, and a great chain, and he laid hold on a dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil, Satan and bound him a thousand years. This is after the six thousand year period is up. Okay? And cast him into the bottom of the pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years shall be fulfilled. This thousand year period is the time that the 144,000 are raised and will be with the Lamb in the Crystal City. And that Crystal City is mentioned in Revelation, the next chapter, the 21st chapter. Alright? And it tells them there'll be like brides and, and a bridegroom. So you notice there's male and female involved. Yes. All right? thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be let loose for a little while. That's 30 years again, 2030. And I saw a throne, and they that sat upon him, and judgment was given unto them. 
and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witnesses of Jesus. That's his disciples, the true disciples who died for him, all right, for the Messiah. And for the word of Allah, because it wasn't just because of the fact that they were Jesus' followers, it was because they were trying to establish Tawheed, the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received the mark upon their forehead or in the palm of their hand, and lived and reigned with the Messiah for how long? A thousand years, which is Daniel 7, 9 again, backing it up. But the rest of the dead lived not again. That's other people, other than them, they were not raised again. Lived not again until what? Until a thousand years were finished. See, the 144,000 were living in righteousness in the tabernacle of the Most High. The word tabernacle merely means tent. You follow? Yes. Tents of Kedah. They were living within inside the tabernacle. But the other people, they will be a part of the damnation of the world. It'll tell you. But the rest of the dead lived not again until a thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. You follow? Stage one. Now, people say the first resurrection was the honor of Elijah Muhammad's resurrection. What I'm doing with Honorable Elijah Muhammad was the same thing. Not a first and second, we are both the first. Honorable Elijah Muhammad was stage one to get people prepared for this. Yes. Blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection. On such the second death has no power. Those people who make up the first resurrection, the first saved, when they leave this world to go into the next world, death has no power over them. Death has lost its sting. They will be given everlasting life. They become immortals. They become gods again. They're not just men, okay? But they shall be priests of Allah and of the Messiah, which they say God is Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. And when a thousand years has expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison, sajid, as they call it in the Quran, and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the world. And this is what happened this year. Gog and Magog to gather together to battle, and the number of whom is the standard to see which battle? The battle of Armageddon mentioned back in 16 of Revelation. Uh, or oh, this is a subtotal because we're coming to the last chapter to the 20th, 21st, and 22nd. It's giving you a subtotal of all the things you read throughout the book of Revelation. You know, it's giving you a total understanding towards the end of the world. It says, And they went up on the breast of the earth and passed the camp of the states about and the beloved city and fire came down from God out of heaven to devour them. Why did fire come down out of heaven to devour them? Because the devil, in Revelation chapter 13, they say when this false nation of blasphemous devils are raised, that one of the miracles they're going to perform is fire from the sky. Well, what do they mean by that in Revelation 13? That this false nation, which is the Antichrist, is going to be performing fire from the sky? Because what happens is when John was talking, there was no such thing as bombs and war. So in his dream, fighting over the land of Israel, he said this devil had the power to perform miracles, to make fire come out of the sky to hurt people. He saw bombs and missiles and stuff fire. That's how he could interpret it. But the Almighty is going to bring down fire from heaven because he says about Noah, he should no longer destroy the world by water, but more over this time by fire. So in the latter day, he's going to bring fire against Satan. Satan's fire is not hot compared to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala got planned for him. Okay? Yes. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of? Fire and brimstone. And brimstone. And what? Where the beast and false prophet are. So you see, this devil here, the devil, the beast, and the false prophets are two different things. I'll show it to you one day. Go ahead. Chakra, you, you definitely answered my question. Chakra. Uh, I, got, I got a couple of questions. Okay. One, one which is, uh, I noticed that there's a certain part of the Bible that you dispel. Which part is that? Well, you just spoke of Acts. Right. Okay, and then there are others that you promote. Yes. Can, can you make uh, uh, right now a statement as to which parts of the Bible should not be believed and which parts should be believed? Yes, I can. Okay. But I'll have to use the Bible to do it. All right? I, I you have a Bible with you? No, no, I don't. Well, let's first take just the New Testament. No, but I, I, I'm trying to find out what is the basis for you saying that this is correct and this, is, this other thing is not correct. I understand what you're trying to do, so I'm going to try to work with you, okay? Okay. Now, if we take the book of Revelation, which was revealed in 96 A.D., all right, to John. Yeah. He's the same one who received the book of John. And we read the first chapter, the first verse, we come up with this. The revelation of Jesus the Messiah, or Christ, which God gave unto him. Who gave this to him? According to the Bible. God gave it unto him. God gave it unto him to do what? To show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent it and he signified it by his angel. The same way he sends all revelations. 
and his servant John. So the book of Revelation here, my brother, Jesus is telling us that he received this book from whom? God. Then in the back of Revelation, in the last chapter of Revelation 22, he tells them in the 19th verse, what? And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. Now, this book Jesus is referring us to, to get our prophecies out of. Go back to 18. And I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. This book. Not the book of Matthew, Mark, Luke, Corinthians, Acts, Hebrews, Galatians. No, the prophecies of what? This book. If any man shall add unto these things, anything he adds to these books, or God shall add unto him plagues which are written in this book, book which the vows again. Of the point I'm trying to make is that Jesus received the book of Revelation according to him by God and said to make all decisions and judgments out of this book. Now, you have to use the writings of his disciples in the way we Muslims use the Hadith to explain things that Muhammad did but not as a law from Muhammad. Because, okay, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, to keep it simple, uh, yes. when you say the book, yes, are yes. you saying Revelation? When I say the gospel of Jesus, I'm saying Revelation. Okay, now, so this is I, the basis for the rest of the Bible not the rest. Or, or that which is to be believed. In the New Testament part, as far as Moses is concerned, then it's the five books of Moses, because that's what he received. So that would be the Torah. Okay, as so far as David is concerned, it would be the Psalms which is the Zabor, and that's what the prophet David received. So when we say the Holy Scriptures, we mean the Torah, five books of Moses, the Psalms of David, and the book of Revelation is the Gospel of Jesus. All the rest of them are letters written by men who are not in the Old Testament, but in the New Testament. They're men who have their own opinions. And if you look at Luke chapter 1, it'll tell you that. Turn to Luke chapter 1 and read it. Luke will make it very clear that he's writing this. Well, let's just read Luke chapter 1 and see what happens. For as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us. First of all, he said, many people have taken upon themselves by hand to make a declaration of things that they believe. He said what? Even as they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. Now these men were called ministers of the word, and they delivered this revelation. He says, it seemed good to me also having perfect understanding of all things from the very first to write unto thee in order most excellent. Now, this man just said that he decided to write this book himself because other people wrote books. Jesus said the book of Revelation came to him from God. You understand the difference? I'd rather put my trust in God than in Luke. Anytime. That's how I make my decision. Not out of my opinion. I make my decision out of reading the scriptures thoroughly and looking at things that people say and say, this man made this up. He said this himself. The book of Revelation comes from God. The book of Luke comes from Luke. Now, you say, well, why do you use the book of Luke in your book? And the reason why I, I use the book of Luke is because Luke was a historian telling the history of Jesus, whereas the book of Revelation is a book of the prophecies of the end of the world. In order for us to find the stories of Jesus and be able to differentiate what is right and what is wrong, we must read the whole New Testament. You follow? So I don't say don't read it, but put your trust only in the book of Injil or the book of Revelation. Cause that so they, are, there, are, there, are there things in Acts that, that can be taken to heart? Sure. A lot of nice writings of Paul in Acts. Yes, but he did that after he was persuaded by James and Barnabas to stop lying on Jesus. Uh, this is a question for you, how many entities speak through you? I, I know you've heard of Mel said Melchizedek, Zozo. Many different beings can communicate through any one medium, mm -hmm. as long as they belong to the same school of thought. Mm -hmm. You won't have a medium that has beings from different realms speaking to him. You'll have all of them, and if they are in different realms, they still ascribe to the same order. The only being that communicates to me is being that communicate who are part of the order of Melisedek. Mm -hmm. Okay? And the number can vary. Do you... Hope, I hope it's not too personal. Do you... Uh,
Do you visualize when this information is, is channeled through you? or at, ta at times, at times uh, beings such as Vulva and them will personify. Mm -hmm. Or they'll stay in an etheric state. Other times I'll just hear a voice and other times it's like intuition. Mm -hmm. I'll do something or say something that I know I didn't know. So that's the most puzzling of all times when I'm in a situation where I have to answer questions about a subject that I don't know and then the answers come out. Mm -hmm. And then I'll go out there and research to make sure and find out that everything I said was mathematically and historically correct and I didn't know it. And I just have to incline to that I have no power at all. I'm just a vessel being used to convey a message. I, I think maybe I didn't make it clear. I mean, when that information comes to you, you know, like when you talk or speak of something that has happened to you, sometimes you can visualize the picture while yeah, you're Yeah, you made yourself clear. Message. When the entities come, mm -hmm. they either come materialized or etheric. Mm -hmm. And if they talk about a time in history, oh. like the time of Musa, alayhi salatu wa salam, I will envision my, in my mind's eye, because as a human being with the faculties of sight, you know that when you look at anything, it reflects a picture back to your octave nerve, upside down on a screen. This is how the eyes work. So they can project on that same screen, which is attached to the brain, by using the molar nerves. And you can look back into history, because history is recorded because it has happened. Because you can remember in pictures your room as a child, right? Mm -hmm. Beings who step out the body, can see the whole, let's say, film of time and can take you out of any point in time and place the actual day and time in technicolor, as you would have it, in your mind and you would see the people you're talking to and the environment they're in. Okay? Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. We now have available another 24 hours of true light tape by popular demand. Our master teacher and spiritual guide, S. Sayyid Al Imam Isa Al Hadi Al Mahdi, has for your listening pleasure and enlightenment a total of 48 hours of true light tape, answering all those questions scholars and professors can only get the answer, covering such topics as why use the books of the New Testament? Is the last name Jehovah? The 200 fallen angels? Which Jesus do you follow? And much, much more. Ask your local Ansar representative, the brothers dressed in white, for copies of the True Light tapes, numbers 1 through 48. If there are no Ansar representatives in your area, call or visit the original tents of Chidar, 717 Bushwick Avenue, Brooklyn, New York, 11221. Also, ask or write for a listing of the most dynamic books in history, authored by Sayyid Al Imam Isa Al Hadi Al Mahdi. And now, let us return to our broadcast. They, they said that the white man was unclean. So let's you know, in this day and time, how you know the unclean from the clean? In this day and time. It's not whether I know it, because what I know don't mean nothing. It's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the scripture. I don't care whether white people are clean or not. If you were here last week, you'd have heard me tell somebody that I've run into white people who want to be Muslim more than black people, and I respect them more. I'm not going to respect you just because you're black. That don't mean nothing to me. I'm going to go by how you serve Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I've run into, like I said, while in my travels, I was in Morocco and lived there for a while. I ran into a white boy right from California. His name was Abdul Hadi. He spoke fluent Arabic, was living in Morocco, made his prayers every day, fasted Ramadan. I fasted, we fasted together, in fact. You follow that? Made Hajj to Mecca. Did all the fundamentals of Islam. And wore his white robe every day. Didn't wear American clothes. He was in Morocco teaching Moroccans Arabic. But then I see black men in America find the truth, still dress like white people, still talk like white people, still work for the white man. And when I weigh him against that person, to me, he is a better Muslim than that black person is a Muslim. You follow? So it's not as far as judging them as white or black in my sight. The scripture tells us in the book of Leviticus what they look like and who they are as far as their physical composition, 
the Holy Quran tells us in Surah Al-Jinn all about their spiritual incarnation. You follow that? And how they work as demons and spirits. So if my decision would mean nothing. It would be what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the creator of the boundless universe, says people are. Now, human blacks are showing themselves more devilish in a lot of ways. Because at least the whites are loyal to what they believe in. Black people that say they're Muslim and still be smoking reefer. Black people that say they're Muslim still smoke cigarettes, still drink wine, still go out in and, and club with women. Black people call themselves Muslims, don't pray five times a day. Black people call themselves Muslims and follow in the way of Muhammad and don't put on a white robe and just keep on using the title. I'm black and I'm Muslim. I don't have to dress that way. I don't have to act like this. And I find that the people who are Christians are more loyal, or the Jehovah Witnesses, as they're called, are more loyal to their doctrine than so-called Muslims are saying they are to theirs. So I have to respect the Jehovah Witness for his faith in what he believes, be it right or wrong, over Muslims who have the truth but ain't believing in it. You understand? Yeah, but still, I'd like to know, as I said, how you know the, the unclean ones from the, the, the clean ones? I just told you. From knowing the book of Leviticus, what I call clean and unclean doesn't mean anything. It's what the scripture says. And if you read Leviticus, it tells you what they look like. Now, whether or not a person marries them, that is on the individual. I have nothing to do with that. I will go by the scripture. And what I see in the scripture is how I'll make my decision by what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. I'm not going to point out the finger. Okay? okay thank you. Peace. Peace. I was wondering um, why, you know, you know, the solar system, you know, the universe and everything like that, right? You know, it got like nine, you're supposed to be nine planets, you know. And, you know, the other eight planets, I was wondering why there's no life form on them planets. First and foremost, they've realized recently that there's ten planets. They have Titan down as another planet. The scientists have now, they found it out in 1970, but they don't want to change the, the book. But you can read it up and you can find out. There's a tenth planet. And there is life on other planets. But see, what we tend to do as human beings, as we call ourselves, we tend to associate life with everything that we know it as and what we see it as. If I, we look at a turtle and say, it moves, it must be alive. And life can be animated or inanimated. Can be etheric and still be alive and not detectable by the physical eye, for instance. Fifty years ago, there was living bacteria that before they had developed microscopes, that they would be considered non-existent because they had nothing that was technical enough for them to see them. You follow? Mm -hmm. So what the white man will do is say, we took a sample of the planet Mars and found out that according to what we use for research, there's no life. Now, then as they advance with computers, they begin to find out ways to sample soil and find other forms of bacteria that are so fine that what they had from 1988 back to the 1919 wasn't able to detect the life form. You understand what I'm saying? So, I'm, and what I'm really saying is there is other life form on other planets. Right. They just don't look always like the Earthling as they'd have them. Right. Is there any righteousness in studying the text of the ancient Egyptians? For instance, the Book of the Coming Forth by day and by night? Well, what happened is Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us to seek knowledge from here even up to China. There's nothing wrong with reading them but they're not mentioned in the Torah, or the Injil, or the Quran, which is the Old Testament, the New Testament by some, and the Last Testament, as something that is fruitful for us. The book of Revelation tells us in the 10th chapter that a book would come after it called a little book, which is the Quran. It also tells John that he would receive another book, which is the book of John. So the last things we read would be, of course, the five books of Moses, the book of the prophets, the book of John, the book of Revelation, and the Quran. It is nothing wrong with reading the Egyptian Book of the Dead. It's nothing wrong with reading the books of Enoch and all the other things out there just to be familiar for when you get in conversation. But they're not to be trusted in because they're not registered as Holy Scriptures according to the Holy Scripture. Unless a person does not believe in the Holy Scripture, you know, he studies Egyptology and he just says, that's what I believe in. And of course, that becomes another side of the coin. But if a person believes in the Holy Scriptures, then they should go to the book to see what it tells us to do. You follow what I'm saying? Yeah. So there's nothing wrong with studying. Study everything, learn everything you possibly can. So that when you have to confront people with the truth, you're able to defend yourself. But don't put your heart and soul in anything that the Almighty has not put his sanction in on. Just read it as information. Did Moses study in the Egyptian mystery schools? 
Yes, Moses did. Musa did study in Egyptian, but he studied under a man named Safa. Is that where he got the uh, Ten Commandments from? No, he left Egypt and went back to the land of Midian and studied under a man named Jethro, who was a descendant of Keturah, Abraham's third wife, an Ishmaelite. And his angelic name, if you look in dictionaries, is Ruel. He's one of the masters. And the prophet that came out of that house is in the Holy Quran under the name Luqman, the prophet Luqman, the book of wisdom, Kitab al Hikmah. Moses got taught by him about the name Hashem. He used to say Yahweh or Yahuwah or Yahuwah because he was not allowed to say Elohim. And he learned from him the name Hashem. Why right here Jews say Baruch Hashem, which is blessings to the Most High, the light coming down. Or he who hears or listens. Okay? The answer to the question is no. He got his mystical teaching completed under a man named Jethro where he found his wife, the poor. Why is there that similarity in the Ten Commandments and the uh, 147 negative confessions? Of Egyptian studies? Yes. Because of the fact that Anton Unkin, and not Tut Unk Amen, but Anton Unkin, who was Nefertiti's husband, was taught by Abraham. And Abraham had the same commandments that in the Ten Commandments in his books called us the Hussein. He uses the same thing. So when he came to Egypt, he taught him those laws long before Moses was even born. So there was monotheism, as it's called today, which is a very bad word that we know from the word theos. Monotheism was practiced in Egypt, in lower Egypt, while in upper Egypt they were idol worshippers. People don't understand that the two empires were ruling simultaneously, upper and lower Egypt. The lower Egyptians were the Nubians, the dark skin, and upper Egypt was constantly being invaded by Amorites, Hittites, and Romans and Greeks who were stealing information and taking it to Greece and setting up the philosophical doctrine of Aristotle, Plato, Cicero, and all the rest of them when he stole to a man named Papasius, took it out of Egypt. They got that from Upper Egypt, which is Alexandria. Lower Egypt was all black. Upper Egypt was a mixed race of people. And Moses was in Upper Egypt and then down into Lower Egypt and then over into Midian. So, because Abraham had originally taught them, that's how they knew about the oneness of Allah. And that's why the, a lot of things in the Egyptian Book of the Dead are the same as in the Torah. The same thing with the Chaldeans. People keep saying, why do the Babylonians have the same story of Noah and creation as the Bible? Well, that's because they still in the research, they find out the Shinar, where Abraham, or Chaldea, is Babylon. And Abraham was teaching about the oneness and the creation way over in Babylon before the books of the Torah were collected. Not before the, the history was written, but before they were collected by the masters. So the Babylonians do have it in Cuneiform and in their tablets, the same story of Noah and Adam. But they use different terms because they had a different dialect. The same way Muslims would say, in America they say Muslim and Mohammed instead of Muslim and Muhammad. They write that down, they write Muslim and Mohammed. You see, eventually people will find that record and they'll say, well instead of them saying Muhammad, they said Mohammed. You know what I'm saying? And so as time goes on, it changes. So the story of Adam will change here. Uh, what purpose did the 24 elders have in Egypt during that time? The 24 elders are the Elohim in Genesis when they speak of the we. Whenever he says we did this, we did that, he's speaking about the Elohim, which were the seraphim, the holy angels of the ark. All right? They were the masses. They are what people are calling today extraterrestrials or UFOs. Or UFOs. They're seeing all over the place. Are y'all familiar that right now in Qatar, for the last couple of weeks, there's been a a UFO hovering, it's been hovering over there in the Persian Gulf, and they're waiting at any moment for it. It's been seen by people by the thousands right now while you're sitting here. And I can't say that it hasn't pulled off yet, but it's in the news that I think the inquirer is doing something on it right now. But they're talking about how it's seen now, and it's a threat that any moment this UFO is going to respond. The masters are the ones who send these UFOs out. There are other galaxies with other beings living that have existed. Jesus referred to them when he says, I came down from heaven. Don't get the Star Trek version of the universe mixed up with reality. Angelic beings are extraterrestrial. Any being that comes into the Earth's atmosphere was not born here, is extra here, and is called an extraterrestrial. When the devil refers to them as UFOs, he's merely saying these things fly and I can't identify them. Angels fly and he's not been able to identify them. The ones that he did identify, he calls them Gabriel, Michael, Raphael, Uriel, and he goes on. The ones he can't identify, he just says, are angels. That was a biblical way of saying UFO. Today they say UFO. 
And he says, he came in a cloud of smoke and a whirlwind of fire. And as he did explain the ship, he saw the standing had amber light, and he saw legs come down and hit the ground. He described the ship to the letter. The Bible scholars in the translation try to turn into something other than what it really is. Extraterrestrial or UFO, the message of angels. Now, and there are bad ones. So let me get that straight. There are some beings that come here and they use you for experiment. Then you say, that's disgusting. And of course you're going to say that's disgusting because you're not a hamster. Hamsters are saying the same, frogs and hamsters and guinea pigs are saying, this, and monkeys are saying the same thing when you put them on a table, the day them and take their brains out so you can investigate what makes them pick to find out cures for yourself. It becomes okay when you do it, but when an extraterrestrial harvest over, takes somebody up on their ship, experiments them, all of a sudden it's so gross and detestable and wrong. But while you've got some chicken up on your table, popping some bread inside his stomach and stuffing him to eat, that's okay. <laughs> but as soon as it happens to somebody on Earth, an extraterrestrial took it, it ain't right. Why is it right for you to put a hamster or a guinea pig or a frog on a table that's alive and cut it open just to see how it's hard to then throw it to the away, that's okay. But when an extraterrestrial picks up a couple of you, puts you on a table and cuts you up, or picks up some of your cows and puts you on a table and dissects it to experiment what they think pick, all of a sudden it's a gross thing. Remember, man is an evolutionary thing, and the angels also have to study what makes you think. You evoluted into what you are. And why you're dying and why you allow your body to be visited by so much bacteria and get sick all the time, it puzzles the masses. And the masses who belong to the scientific part of the Federation, and those are the little ones you know, we always talk about, those are scientists. They're the ones that's trying to find out ways to help you cure yourself. But as fast as they come up with a cure for one thing, you all give birth to another one. As fast as they gave you a cure for polio, you didn't come up with something else. Uh, my question relates to the mixing of the seeds and uh, the effects of um, mixing of African seeds with the Caucasian and the effects of the slaves. Times and the subsequent effect it has on the spirit and the soul in later generations. So let's say an uh, African with a mix of that seed, what's the effect on, not the physical effect, I'm saying spiritual effect from the child that, that emanates from that, that comes from that? If y'all would move down, because y'all reading 72, it's a very interesting quote, and a lot of Sunni Muslims try to use it because they don't understand it. If you'd move down to the sixth verse of the same chapter, it's going to tell you about what the brother just asked, about men who seek out jinns to live with them. And he uses the word mortals. You see it? And indeed, O Muhammad, individuals of humankind used to invoke the protection of individuals of the jinn right. so that they increase them in revolt against Allah. But you know what's so interesting? It says right in there, Rijalun, men al insan, human men, the word Rajalun, it means a human being, a man. You see it there? Mm -hmm. And then if you drop down, you see B Rajalin Minal Jin on the next line. Mm -hmm. From human jinns. Mm -hmm. So here in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us that there are human beings who are men and sad who are seeking companionship and friendship and guidance with human beings that are jinns. Now, when I was asked the Sunni Muslim, okay, the Quran tells us that Allah created man, Iqra bi ismi rabbika alladhi khalaka, khalaq al-insana min alaq. That he created man, khalaq al-insana min alaq, from a dividing cell. That's the man, okay? We shape with that, because Allah is insan. Now he uses rajalin min al-jinn. And when I turn to them and say, I understand when Allah says he created man, insan, all right? Now, who is this jinn man? Then they try to make jinn a spirit. I said, well, Allah referred to the jinn as a spirit because he says that the jinn whispers into the hearts of men. Min al jinnati wa nas in surat nas the last section of the Holy Quran. He whispers into the duri and nas, min al jinnati wa nas into the chest of men from amongst the jinn and men. So now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us that there are human jinns on earth with us, devils. When the honorable Elijah Muhammad tried to say that, they tried to make him look like he was crazy because the brothers were going to the human jinn and asking them about what the Honorable Elijah Muhammad is saying. Meaning, they were going to pale Arabs who are the jinn and asking them to verify what the brother, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, was saying about them. And it really expected a white man to say the Honorable Elijah Muhammad was right. They really expected him to turn around and say, yes, we're the devil. Did you really expect him to say that? In the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, he gives us the jinn, and the word I want you all to see, 
is the brother would write the letter Ra, the letter Jim, and the letter Lam. Rajalin. And look it up in any Arabic dictionary. It means man and it means a mortal being. Not when you use the word man in the sense of insan, which could be mankind or human, you know, human, but man. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is using be rajalin min a jinni for the jinn, a human jinn. That is the most important thing to get established in the head. That in Arabic it says one thing, and in the English these guys who were translating these Qurans were jinns themselves. So they wasn't going to tell the truth about themselves. The way they get to the blue eyes and change it to Blair. You know enough about Arabic to you know the word Azraq means blue. Then they got Zurqa in the 20th chapter, the 102nd verse, and they say, oh, it means Blair, or it means glaucoma, and a whole bunch of things that it just doesn't mean. Because here you got blue eyed guys translating the Quran, and you got these so called pale Arabs, and they're not going to tell y'all what this is really saying. They're not going to tell y'all that these jinns are them that Allah told you, and some of them converted. Now, if you go to the spiritual aspect of it, you have the seraphim and the cherubim, or the karabim and the seraphim. And the righteous angels, which is the seraphim, warred against the cherubim, the cherubim. Some of the cherubim were used to protect the garden of Eden. Some of the cherubim were used to protect the ark of the tabernacle, the covenant for the children of Israel. So some of these evil jinns had to have repented and started working in the service of Allah. You follow that? There are cherubims that became angels. All the angels didn't fall. It tells you one third of the angels fell. All the angels didn't follow Iblis. Only some of them did. So the angels that were cherubim that stayed behind became the warriors. They're the result of the plagues of the earth. They're the angels that bring the plagues because the seraphims don't do that. They bring the revelation. So there were jinns who had converted to righteousness. Then there were certain people on earth who heard the Qur'an, who were jinn human beings who converted to righteousness. You know what I'm saying? There's a lot of pale Arabs who accept this Qur'an for what it is. And then when the prophet Abraham or Ibrahim went up into the mountains, they tell you he came out in Genesis and he brought the souls that he accumulated up there out. And those were jinns that he met up in the Caucasus Mountain, the tribes of Canaan. And they came out with him and migrated with him. So there's several interests in history where the devil, as a man, was traveling in the company of the righteous. Go ahead. So with those jinn that accept it and become righteous, do they have a place here within the tabernacle? In other words, if a white Arab who converted to al-Islam and appeared to be righteous came to try to move in the Nubian Islamic Hebrew mission, could he? Well, the well, question basically is the appearance the reality? Yes, the appearance is the reality because the appearance on the outside is a result of the seed on the inside. And if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not want us to identify them by their color, he would not have made us different colors. He says in the Quran, I made you into different colors. Mm -hmm. So if anybody tells you it's what's inside of a person's heart, they're really saying that the Heavenly Father made a mistake. Because the Heavenly Father wanted us all to look alike, we'd all look alike. He wants us to look different. And then that's just a, what you call a physical appearance. Then when we study that scientifically, we find out genetically we're stronger, our skin is stronger, we control the dominant gene. So then why would he make a race of people who are genetically inferior to one race? If he wants equality, why did he make us physically stronger than them? If he wanted equality between us, why did he put the diamonds, the gold, the platinum, the oil in Africa and not in Europe? He expected the black race to be dominant. He wanted us to be the richest. We gave it up and emulated the white man, left Africa, and that's why we're starving over here in America. Because had we stayed in Africa where we belong, we control the diamond, the gold, and all the natural minerals in the world. And if the Heavenly Father controls where diamonds, gold, platinum, emeralds, and petrol goes, then he intended for me and you, people of color, to eventually become the richest people in the world. If a black man and a white woman lays down, the baby's classified black. And vice versa, the baby's classified black because we have the dominant gene. So if we were cruel as a race of people, because we are the majority of the world, not the minority, we can all go out and marry one white person and that would be the end of their whole race after the first generation. Because when the baby's born, any baby that's not all white to them, non-white is considered black. You understand? Yes. We can acknowledge the whole white race just by integrating with them. That's one of their strongest points, you see. Okay, back to the other question. Would they have a place here in the community? 
Uh, and Jane, I would accept right That's what that astonishes you mean, a white person? Yes, that's right. No, because this is a Nubian Islamic Hebrew mission. That Nubian means you have to be Nubian. And I'm saying that not because I want it that way, because the scriptures tell them that. Told Abraham, do not let your daughters mix with the Canaanites amongst whom you dwell. Right now, we dwell amongst the Canaanites because we are in the U.S. of A. with them. But don't let your children marry them. That's a divine commandment. Okay, on another subject, I was watching the television. Uh, I saw uh, Sadiq uh, Almari, I believe his name is, in uh, Sudan. He was speaking on um, the purchase of uh, uranium in the Sudan. I was just wondering what his relationship, or if there is one, with the community. Is he the Prime Minister of Sudan? He's, yeah, he's my first cousin. Your first cousin, he's the Prime Minister? He's the present Prime Minister of Sudan. Oh. Yes, there is a definite link between us. What is that link? We're one brother. Ansar is there and Ansar is there the same. We're all the same. But he does not rule us. We rule the religious part, and he right now is ruling the political part of the country. But the doctrine of the Ansar of the world is the doctrine here in America now. It wasn't like that five years ago, because mm -hmm. they were being suppressed by a regime that overthrew them in 1970. But now, since Sir Fadid came to power, we have had the gates open in Sudan, so now the Ansar law pamphlets are circulating all over the Arab world. And now the Ansars of the Sudan are Ansar law under your teaching in America, as opposed to your being Ansari under their teachings there. When you start meeting the Ansars on the streets here, they're trying to get over here to meet Imam Isa now. They're trying to get me to leave here and go back there. And I keep telling them, I'm here sent to the West for the people here. My purpose is in the West, the lost tribe. Not the found tribe. Y'all are the law. Y'all need the divine knowledge. Y'all don't need no fundamental Islam. Y'all need something to take y'all out of a coma. Our people in America is in a coma state. You don't need no little tribute religion that just says bow. You need details and math and history and science. You need the whole thing being instilled in your heart because you need big faith because you're living in the belly of the whale like Jonah. You're living right inside the devil's belly. Little tribute faith, that's why you see people come into Islam and drop out. Join the Jehovah Witness and drop out. Join the Seventh Day Adventists and drop out. Because they're not getting that divine science. You got to get that divine science in your heart. The latest fleet of pamphlets I'm putting out right now are the ones that you should put your most concentration on. Because what I'm doing is I'm unlocking a certain type of spell. Right now my concentration is on taking the head of the Antichrist, the fake Jesus. You have been listening to The True Light, sponsored by the original Tents of Kedar, located at 717 Bushwick Avenue in Brooklyn, New York. You are also invited to attend the Questions and Answers class every Sunday from 1 p.m. to 6 p.m. in the Hall of Knowledge at 548 Park Street in Brooklyn, New York. And now, more profound than ever before, the Pamphlets of Peace, authored by the Master Teacher and Spiritual Guide, Es Sayyid El Imam Isa El Hadi El Mahdi covering such topics as who's who on the planet Earth, the resurrection, who was noble Drew Ali, who was Jesus' father, who was Marcus Garvey, St. Paul, disciple or deceiver, and much, much more. Also to aid your spiritual growth, we have a beautifully crafted hand-woven prayer rug designed by El Sayyid El Imam Isa El Hadi El Mahdi. We also have a large assortment of prayer beads, Nubian and Sufi oils and incense. The original tense of Kedar would like for you to write or call us and let us know how the true life has changed your life. Remember, above all things, truth is the truth. That was the first five verses of Surah Al-Alaq, originally revealed to the Prophet Muhammad as the first chapter. It is today recorded as the 96th. As translated by as Sayyid Al-Imam Isa Al-Hadi Al-Mahdi, it reads as follows. O still the Prophet of Allah, Muhammad, 
by the supreme sovereignty of your sustainer and creator, you are being ordered to read by beginning with the name of your illustrious sustainer, who is the creator of all things. He, Allah, created all human beings of a self-separating. So read, because your sustainer is most generous. He, Allah, taught human beings what they would have never known. I used to be a follower of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad until he died. Then I became a follower of his son, Wallace B. Muhammad. But I came to find out that he was not teaching the same thing as the messenger. Wallace B. Muhammad teaches that you can work for anybody, even the white man who is the devil. Wallace B. Muhammad teaches that the white man is not, even though the scriptures say the white man is the devil. Then I started reading books written by Imam Isa, and he explains the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's teachings better than anybody I've ever heard, even Minister Farrakhan. Imam Isa teaches the importance of doing for self, just like Elijah taught us. Imam Isa also has his followers dressing in the garb of the prophets, like the Quran says. I used to call myself a black Israelite Jew, because I thought I was from the tribe of Levi. Nobody could tell me different. Then I finally read one of Elie Mamisa's books, and I found out that the Israelites never called themselves Jews, that they were all destroyed, except for the tribes of Judah and Dan. And that in the Old Testament, the book of Moses, it does speak about Muhammad. And thanks to Elie Mamisa, I now know that I'm an Ishmaelite, and that we should follow all of the scriptures. This is a devoted follower of El Selassie, the conquering land of Judah. And to I read the pamphlet written by the master Imam Isa about Magazavi. I might learn much about how Magazavi never wore dreadlocks, and how his Muslim name was Musa, and the color of his flag was red, black, and green, the same exact flag the Mahdi of Sudan fought under. After encountering the divine truth of the master Imam Isa, I am now devoted to the answer. This is from the 56th Surah of the Holy Quran, the 8th verse. And read, O Sustainer, complete for us our life. And forgive us, for surely you have the power over all things. 